Hey, what's up shiny happy people? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. The Sennheiser Ambio Soundbar Max is excessive in volume, mass, cost, name the category. And it sounds pretty good too. I mean, it freaking better. What I got here is a fresh alternative to the extreme highs and lows of the Ambio Max. You got it? The Ambio Soundbar Plus. The Plus that was released September 2022 to attract the less extreme soundbar buyer is currently retailing at $1,400 and is boldly advertised as an all-in-one 7.1.4 channel system, which until about five minutes ago, 7.1.4 exclusively looked something like this. <clears throat> and the Plus has two more official channels than the Max. The Emperor most definitely has clothes. Now, I imagine at least some of you are watching because you think Sennheiser is the alpha and omega of soundbar greatness. Got it. Sennheiser is your soundbar boy. I don't think that's an unreasonable stance. And you're leaning towards the plus because maybe you don't have enough manpower to move the max where it needs to go. Um, maybe it doesn't fit through your front door, it's taller than your TV, your wife said it's ugly, and she prefers your more successful friend's soundbar. Or maybe it's cheaper. How could I know? The question we have to grapple with is, after shedding significant cost, size, and mass, is there enough baby left here to make this a compelling value proposition? Let's work through that together. Oh yeah, how could I forget the Ambio Wireless or Wired Sub, retailing at $600, released concurrently with the Plus. While both Ambio support third-party powered wired subs, the Ambio sub is clearly the one that will get paired most with the Ambio Plus. So the pair here reflects something approaching as good as it gets for this bar at the time of this recording. Okay, set up. Stop wasting time and download the Sennheiser Smart Control app. Setup is straightforward. My bar was detected very quickly. Getting it connected to the World Wide Web was uneventful. Once your bar is set up, you can choose to sign up for the various internet-based services at your leisure and or add a subwoofer, which is done in the system menu under settings. So yeah, this sub is not a plug and play, which is not a bad thing. A longer setup in my experience means a less vulnerable connection. At some point, you will be prompted to calibrate the system and install any potential updates. You should do all of those things. The whole calibrate and update process may take up to 10 to 15 minutes, so don't do these things while everyone is waiting to get the movie started for movie night. I got bad dad reviews for that one. Build quality and design. The first thing that struck me is just how unassuming the plus is in width, height, depth, and weight. It is straight up average, a 180 degree directional strategy shift from the max. Moving away from size, I think it's fair to call this bar stylish. The equator is covered in a classy suit supported by a rigid structure all the way around, which at the very least protects the drivers from devilish, greasy little people fingers. The upholstery, which I know is not always desired, looks decent out of the box, but that will probably change over time as the whole world starts sticking to it. A little plastic strip is exposed on the bottom, which provides just enough space to spell out Sennheiser and house the Ambio display, which illuminates when the Ambio effect is active. More on that later. The top of the bar is a textured plastic and is angled down, which is not normal. On the left and right, there are generously sized grills. In the middle, you have your capacitive bar controls, Sennheiser logo, microphones, mic mute button, and the, what's that? The main display? And they put the codec status indicators on top too? And no, the weird sloping top doesn't fix the visibility problem. Stupid top displays on a stupid slope. I assume in repentance for the grave sin of placing two displays where they cannot be seen, the ports point straight back, which is proven to reduce wrist strain, HDMI cable damage, and red hot rage. I spend a lot of time plugging and unplugging things into soundbars. It's not as glamorous as it sounds. As far as bars that wear clothes go, the Plus is one of the better dressed ones. The build is sturdy and confidence inducing. The Ambio Sub, the styling and size has this passive aggressive tone that whispers, why am I here? The Ambios already have subs built in. 
It takes practice, so don't get frustrated if you can't hear it yet. The only design element worth calling out is the cloth grill on top here um, with the S logo, which is admittedly kind of unique. The Ambio sub does adopt a closed enclosure, which I suppose may spark some debate on whether that's a good thing or not. I'll just kind of discuss whether I think it sounds good. You'll find all the ports on the bottom. The sub casing is plastic that while falling short of the premium feel of say the Sonos Bose or Sony sub, the build quality is more in line with other bi-separate subs than the all-in-one box types. Driver array. The bar has 400 watts of RMS power and a frequency range of 38 hertz to 20 hertz. 38 hertz being impressively low for a bar. Now, if you're only interested in a bar that is made of 150% speaker stuff like the Max, uh, this is not your bar. This bar has nine woofers, seven traditional two inch aluminum cone full range woofers and two four inch cellulose cone drivers, giving this bar the LFE channel credential. Each woofer has a dedicated Class D amplifier. The tweeters, tweeter Bueller, tweeter Bueller. The last soundbar I reviewed with no tweeters was the Sony HTG 700. I shared some aggressively sassy thoughts about it. So how are the nine woofers sprinkled about? Well, three in the front, making up the left, center, and right channel, which for reference is typically the number of drivers that are dedicated to just the center channel on a flagship soundbar system. Anyway, you'll find a single woofer on each end of the bar, which are tasked with surround rear channel duties. Two upward firing woofers for normal height effect business, and two larger upward firing woofers for, as I mentioned, the low stuff. A traditional read would conclude this is a 5.charitable1.2 channel system, not a 7.1.4. The plus very much appears to be signaling, think, quality over quantity, though I've grown accustomed to both quality and quantity, spending so much personal time with the flagships. The Ambio Sub has 300 watts of RMS power with a 27 to 80 hertz range. Audio codex. As you would expect, you have your typical Dolby and DTS support all the way up to the lossless formats Dolby True HD and DTS HD Master Audio, which is the foundation for Atmos and DTSX, respectively. In addition, the Plus supports MPEG-H audio. This format is kind of known as the Dolby Atmos of next generation broadcast TV, um, adopted in South Korea, Brazil, and some lesser known streaming services. MPEG-H audio is the foundation of 360 reality audio, the Dolby Atmos of music streaming, unless Dolby Atmos is the Dolby Atmos of music streaming. Um, in either case, 360 reality audio is supported on this bar and can be transmitted over Bluetooth. Wireless playback, the trifecta with some sprinkles. So Bluetooth 5.0, Chromecast and AirPlay 2. Accompanied by Tidal and Spotify Connect. Tidal Connect offers something special in that it's not a device to audio hardware service, but rather a Tidal server to audio hardware service, which may sound arbitrary, but it enables higher res streams and frees the audio on your phone. So you can start the music for the party you know, with your phone, and the music will continue to play as you watch Never Enough Tech YouTube videos with your friends. It's a miracle. The Plus does have an onboard microphone for Alexa and Google Assistant support. The mic can be disabled. The mic performance is average, nothing special. The app, it's one of the better ones as far as I can tell. On the main page here in the first box, you have your input and volume controls along with codec confirmation and a play pause mute button. Right below, you have the option to turn on or off the Ambio effect. This is the effect that puts the bar into everything 3D everywhere all at once, and the capability that inspired the Ambio branding, in case that wasn't obvious. Below, you have links to sound demos, including DTSX and Atmos, if you're curious about the 3D performance but don't have any content handy. Fake it till you make it. Here are your audio preset selections, including adaptive, music, movie, news, neutral, and sports. And you can shape any one of these presets with these four EQ bands, which are labeled foundation, low mid, clarity, and brilliance, which more technically would read something like bass, low mid, high mid, and highs. If the Ambio feature is activated, you can adjust its intensity here. 
At the bottom here, you can toggle the night mode and voice enhancement features and quickly recalibrate the system if you have rearranged the room, gained weight, or are just generally worried that something has happened that might impact the room acoustics. In settings here, you have a center and sub-module volume controller. When playing a particular kind of codec, like DTSX, you can adjust peaks and loudness and dynamic range. The Dolby Virtualizer option here is interesting. When turned on, all the Ambio slash sound mode specific stuff is turned off and the sound is true to Dolby's intent. The inputs, name them as you wish. User interface, decide which LEDs you wanna see and how bright you want them. The remote, think elemental. It feels like a chiseled piece of stone. It does something philosophically that I appreciate. It focuses on single press, high impact options. So no setting menus, D-pads, or confusion. On the remote, you have a multifunction button that does play pause type things, an Ambio effects toggle, volume, source, and sound modes. It doesn't let you do everything, but it lets you do common and useful things very quickly. Bar controls, decent offering, all capacitive from left to right, input toggle, Bluetooth pairing button, volume up, your multi-purpose button, and volume down. The multi-purpose button on the bar acts as a voice assistant activator and can control playback using different press patterns. Ports, more generous than most bars. So eARC, along with two HDMI inputs, pass-through capabilities are not special, supporting only 4K 60 Hz and Dolby Vision. If you have a music streamer and or turntable, you have both an optical and auxiliary input. Unlike other bars, like say the ARC, the optical input is decoupled from eARC, so you can switch from TV sound, eARC, to streamer sound, optical. It's a nice touch. Adding to the fun, you have sub-out, RCA, for plugging in a third-party powered sub, a USB port for just updates, and an ethernet port. The displays, there are three of them. One in front, that confirms whether the Ambio feature is active. Second, your codec confirmation display, which illuminates the active codec. It's limited to the special 3D audio one, so Atmos DTSX and MPEG H audio. And third, the main display, which is a one-dimensional LED array that communicates via light animation patterns and color. A few examples, volume level indicator, update progress, Alexa responses, Title Connect Active. It's clever and useful if you take a few minutes to page through the manual. Would have been great if it were placed somewhere you could see it. As mentioned, all these displays can be turned off and set to various brightness levels in the app. System expandability. This product is quite odd on the expandability front. Unfortunately, there are no satellite speakers anywhere in the universe to pair with the Ambio bars. I've searched extensively. However, you can add four, yes, four Ambio subs wirelessly. That's one more than three. So four subs and zero surround speakers. I'm sorry, this is causing a minor computational error on my end. Now, as I mentioned, there is a sub out RCA port on the bar, which means you can take any powered sub, including the Ambio sub, and assess whether it makes the system sound better. Go nuts. The sound. At a high level, well, it exceeds expectations based on form factor, but falls well short of what $2,000 worth of soundbar is capable of these days. The good stuff. Well, for a Schmedium soundbar and Schmedium base unit, it can bruise on the low end and can get quite loud. So let's put a big no worry stamp on those boxes. Further, it offers what I sensed as state-of-the-art clarity from a soundbar. Just technically sound, sharp, stylish, clean. Matches the look of the bar. Classy. This was appreciated in slower paced streaming shows and action packed movies. The sounds you must hear to make a scene intelligible, so forefront sound like dialogue, the clink of a bullet, whisper, big flappy dragon wings, all get laser etched on your face. There is a competent intensity in the experience all throughout the frequency range, even without tweeters, which surprised me. The bad stuff. The side and rear spatial effects are largely absent, and the few appearances you get are meek. And I really tried. I went to rooms all over the house I thought would be flattering, so regular walls and ceilings, 
I just couldn't get anywhere near that 7.1.4 promise. In the action scenes I've watched over and over and over again the last three years, I really missed not only the audio sensation of getting my head knocked off, but the atmospheric details that are so critical in giving the sound buoyancy and an animated spirit that I believe to be particularly present in the, let's say, Q990B. And the arc, but to a lesser extent. I just don't think this setup has enough soldiers to deliver on all those critical fronts. The Ambio Max, from what I can remember 18 months ago when I reviewed, is obviously a more capable speaker and is definitely capable of rendering more of that fizzy atmosphere. So if you're willing to spend more money for a more fully rounded sound, the Ambio Max can deliver for sure. But like the Plus, it is not a serious contender in the 360 all around you fight. Sennheiser released some surrounds already and unlocked the potential of the Plus and Max. So about the Ambio bass. Yeah, it's way more impressive than it looks. It gets low with minimal distortion. It's very adept at the handoff between bar and sub. However, I have no idea why anyone would buy this bar with four subs. That just seems way over the top and generally like it would lead to an unbalanced sound. Now, my more greedy instincts could tolerate a four sub scenario with the Ambio Max and dedicated surround speakers. That setup is perhaps a Dragon Slayer. So what about those sound controls? I generally found myself keeping the Ambio effect on at the regular level. It does tend to give the sound a little more lift. Other ways I liven the sound was with this clarity band here, interjects a little more fun into your favorite tracks. If the sound is coming across a bit thin, consider giving the lower mids a boost. It adds a few calories to the mix. My sound mode of choice was adaptive. Okay, my closing thoughts. Forgetting about sound for a second, what you have here is a very stylish, well-built, feature-rich home audio product, shoved into a family-friendly form factor. Setup and operation was largely frustration-free, though I have had a few occasions where my Samsung TV did not recognize the bar. A full power cycle of all the components solved the issue. In regards to the sound, it's definitely competent, clear, and nimble with an impressive frequency range. Unfortunately, the spatial promise was not fulfilled. You get something like a complex front soundstage with some height effects, but that's about it. Atmospheric submersion was largely absent and I think really made plain just how critical rear speakers and tweeters are if seeking a satisfying cinematic experience. All right, wrapping this up, interact with the things. Catch you on the next one.